Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Wednesday, July 31st. I think they use it like a piggy bank. Um, it, they know the money's there and they may use it for any number of things. It's not all bad fiscal news. Chicago saw a windfall from certain kinds of tax revenue last year. The outlook for the U.S. economy remains favorable, and this action is designed to support that outlook. The Federal Reserve cuts interest rates for the first time in more than 10 years. Another day, another data breach. This time, Capital One admits more than 100 million of its credit card users have had their personal data hacked. Amara Enya was a rising star. Now former campaign workers are suing her. And good news for Illinois finances, our Spotlight Politics teams is on it. I mean, some people get dollhouses, you know, they play with it for a while, and then, you know, they get tired of it. I never got tired. The dollhouses she's made fill her basement. Now she dreams of creating a museum to share them with the world. Jeffrey Bear on Polish cathedral-style churches that tower over neighborhoods across Chicago. And visit a local house on the route of the Underground Railroad that was built by a man who was also an accomplished painter of early Illinoisans. All that and more next on Chicago Tonight. Thanks for joining us. I'm Phil Ponce. A new state law designed to help women get equal pay. Amanda Vinicky has that story and more of what's making news in Chicago tonight. Amanda. Phil, come October, Illinois employers will no longer be able to ask job applicants about their salary history. Packers say that helps to put women who typically earn less than their male counterparts on the path to higher pay. The law signed today by Governor J.B. Pritzker also makes clear that co-workers are free to discuss their compensation with each other. Actor Jossie Smollett could still face criminal charges for allegedly lying to Chicago police about an attack investigators say he staged. This after Cook County Judge Michael Tooman kept clear the path for a special prosecutor who could potentially refile charges. Tooman denied Smollett's request for a new judge and for leave to intervene in the case. Smollett's attorneys maintain he's innocent and say it's clear nobody wants the real truth. More on this story, plus a court update on Chicago R&B singer R. Kelly is up on our website. State Representative Kelly Cassidy was instrumental in passing a law that makes marijuana legal in Illinois. Now her wife, Candace Gingrich, has a top job at a cannabis company with connections here. Revolution Florida, the sister company of Illinois-based Revolution Enterprises, announced it has hired Gingrich as vice president of its expanding Florida operations. Gingrich, sister of former U.S. House Speaker Newt Gingrich, will also be Revolution's LBGTQ ambassador. Cassidy says the Illinois House Democrats ethics officer said there was no problem with the arrangement. She says Revolution went out of its way to ensure Illinois will not be part of her wife's portfolio. The Sears, I mean Willis, Tower has lost another tallest title. Five years ago, One World Trade Center took its place as the tallest building in North America. Now the Chicago Tribune reports another New York building. The under construction Central Park Tower has surpassed the Willis for having the tallest roof. As for the weather, clear tonight with a low around 58 degrees. Then tomorrow, a beautiful sunny with a high near 82. And now, Phil, back to you. Thank you, Amanda. The city of Chicago could be in line for a giant windfall of tax revenue, just in time to help face a $700 million budget cap. A new report from the county clerk's office indicates it could amount to manna from heaven, but some observers say if it sounds too good to be true, that's because it is, Parrish has, has the details. Parrish, tell us about it. Well, Phil, there is no magic pill to the budget problems for the city, but this is pretty good, so let's dispense with the lead right away. Chicago took in $841 million in TIF revenue last year, and that's up about $180 million more than the year before. So all you need to know from that graph is 
there's more TIF revenue coming in every single year. So more than ever last year, and the reason for that is because of the reassessed property values. It meant higher tax assessments and wealthier properties, and that means more money for some of these TIF funds. So tax increment financing is that controversial yet oft misunderstood economic tool that the city has at its disposal. Here's a map of all the city's TIF districts. Again, all you need to know here is a TIF district is the area there in color. There's more than 100 of them. And so let's try and explain TIF. It's, it's, it's when the city designates one of those districts, it freezes all of the property tax revenues for 23 years in that district. And so any incremental increase in value of, of your property or new construction, all that money goes into the TIF fund for that 23 years. It's been described in the past as a slush fund controlled by the mayor. I mean, ideally, it's to go to economic development projects or public infrastructure projects. Today, Cook County Clerk Karen Yarbrough came out with a comprehensive analysis of the city and county's TIFs so taxpayers know what they're paying for. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly. And what, what I think that our office is going to do um, is continue to try to get um, the electorate's um, attention on exactly what's happening here and what TIF dollars are for. I think they use it like a piggy bank. Um, it, they know the money's there and they may use it for any number of things. So those of you who live somewhere where there's a TIF or if you live in a TIF, you should pay attention to your village fathers and mothers on um, how the money's being used. So $180 million, that's a big chunk of money. Is that going to go or would it go to filling the shortfall that the city is expected to see? It certainly could, Phil, but here's the issue. If there's a TIF surplus, the mayor has broad discretion to basically declare a TIF surplus, meaning there's more money in those TIF accounts than they need to spend on the projects that they've decided to spend it on. Mayor Emanuel has done this for years, but only a portion of that surplus would go to the city. It's in the tens of millions of dollars for the city budget. It's not hundreds of million dollars through the surplus method. Closing the TIFs would be potentially um, hundreds about 150 million um, potentially. But again, you would have to look to see that the work of the near south, near north, and the Kinsey quarter, three of the biggest TIFs that are set to expire, is done and that you don't need their revenue for other purposes. So what Lawrence Massal is saying there, some of the TIFs in the central area are set to expire. Their 23-year period is about to be over. The mayor has discretion to close those TIFs early and take back uh, the revenue. Some aldermen have campaigned on closing all of the TIFs, getting rid of TIFs in general. In fact, one activist from the nonprofit Civic Lab has long advocated for getting rid of TIFs, saying that they steal money that could go toward blighted neighborhoods. So for those folks in struggling communities in, in Lawndale and, and uh, 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 places that have been uh, suffering, the TIFs will never help you. And they can't. They, they park the money, they handcuff the money where there's already prosperity. So um, bad news all around. I'm going to take a look at that map once again. You see that big giant red chunk at the top. That's uh, a TIF that was put into effect by Mayor Emanuel about three years ago. All that money is to go toward the modernization of the red and the purple line on the CTA. That has brought in $115 million in the three years it's been there. It's by far Chicago's wealthiest TIF. But the thing about that one is it's the only TIF where as part of the agreement, half of that revenue has to go to CPS. So this is money that mm. CPS has seen above and beyond what it normally gets. Meanwhile, suburban Cook County saw about $339 million in TIF revenue last year. That's a decrease over the year prior as opposed to Chicago. And another important thing to note, two giant new TIFs, the biggest in the city, were just passed before, Rahm, before the end of Rahm Emanuel's term. One in the Lincoln Yards area to help fund infrastructure for Lincoln Yards, and then one for the 78 neighborhood in the South Loop to help build that uh, neighborhood out. Those could be worth more than $2 billion. So there could be pressure to close some TIFs, but there still are big TIFs on the horizon. Paris, thank you. And now to Carol Marine and some surprising news from the Federal Reserve. Carol. Thank you, Phil. The Federal Reserve has cut interest rates for the first time since the 2008 
financial disaster. The nation's central bank voted 8 to 2 to cut rates by a quarter point, which brings interest rates somewhere between 2 and 2.25 percent. While the U.S. economy maintains its record-breaking expansion, some wonder whether the Fed reacted to softening global markets or perhaps even pressure from President Donald Trump. Joining us to provide their insights on this, economics professor Tassos Meliaris of Loyola University and Michael Miller of DePaul University. Thank you both for being here tonight. Sure. All right, so Tassos, let's start with you. Your reaction to the Federal Reserve cutting interest rates? It was expected and very wisely for the past several months the Fed has prepared the markets and the markets anticipated. So the only issue is, if it's not a surprise, was it really necessary? And? And I believe, uh, I am not convinced that it was absolutely necessary. I'm a little bit, I, I, my position is with the two people who voted against it, and I'll be happy to explain why. And w <laughs> let, me, let me follow up on that in just a minute. So Mike, your reaction to the cutting of interest rates? It was the right thing to do, and it was in reaction to a mistake they made in December. They should have left the interest rates around 2% back in December, but for some reason they raised the rate. Uh, there was no reason to because the outlook for inflation was not troublesome. The outlook for employment was not troublesome. But now we're seeing with the economies both of the United States with a little bit of slowing and with uh, Europe and parts of Asia slowing down as well, this is the time to do it. it of course correction. Of course, yeah, exactly. It's the right thing to do. So going back to us to those mm. two who defected from the others who voted for it. What's the difference between those members? So the issue here is an issue of judgment. So you need to look at all the positive factors. And the positive factors, like you mentioned, the economy is doing remarkably well. Labor markets are doing very well. Inflation is under control. Stock market up 20%. And the budget and fiscal policy is very stimulative. So if you take all those positives, you have to compare them with the negatives. How much weight do you give to problems with trade with China? It's been going on for a long time, and in my judgment, will continue for the next five years. It's not going to be resolved overnight. Europe, and in particular, the situation with the European Central Bank cutting interest rates, and Brexit has been around for some time. So the Fed came and said, we are not happy with the fact that inflation is 1.5 below our target. And we want to increase it from 1.5 to 2. So we need to further stimulate the economy. It's not a very convincing argument. Mike, the counterpoint to that is? is I, I, what you say, <laughs> that a lot of these points make sense, but it has, inflation has been below its target for years. It bumped up against two for just a short period of time. And uh, prices need to be going up as part of the, uh, ex the exhilaration within the economy. And the, the Fed has one tool, and that tool is interest rates. And they have two goals. That is maximum employment, which we have, and stable inflation, which we don't have. We don't have inflation at the rate that they would want. The only tool they have to get us back to where that, tool, where, where that goal would be would be to lower the rate of interest, which they should have never raised it, like I say, in the first place. And if you look at inflation, since it's been below its target for so long, we could have inflation above 2%, say 2.5%, for years, and we would still not have a price level which was out of line with what should have been the case. So wages, though we may have employment, full employment, wages are not in the view of an awful lot of people who do have a job at a full level, whatever. Does that play into any of this? In a small part, because obviously if wages were to go up, then businesses would increase the prices of the products that they sell and their prices would go up. But because we are in, in a technology-driven economy and extremely efficient, there is a risk that we experienced both during the internet bubble and the housing bubble, if you keep interest rates very low and you try to stimulate the economy, could it be that instead of inflation and general prices going up, 
we experience asset price inflation and bubbles, there is a risk. And interestingly enough, Powell, in his statement, he remained absolutely silent on the issue of financial markets. Yeah, but you look at financial markets, I, I accept if you look at the S&P 500 and, and a couple stocks within there, you're up 20%. But if you look at the Russell 2000, look at a much broader case, we're up 2 or 3% for the year. It, 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 you have a couple stocks that are just pulling everything up. And if you look across the board, you don't see financial price inflation. And I don't know how the Fed would ever decide when we had financial price inflation. Many years ago, Alan Greenspan talked about irrational exuberance. And that was in 1996. Sure. And he's thinking, oh, maybe the stock market is growing too much. We went four more years. The stock market rose something like 40 or 50 percent from there. And we had a wonderful run. We had the best run at, at that point in history up, uh, that we had ever had. He was completely wrong. There was not irrational exuberance. Mm -hmm. The last thing I want is for the Fed to be deciding whether the stock market is too high or too low. But then there is the question, and I know the Fed pushes back on this, that they are not pressured by the president or by what the president wants in terms of interest rates, but were they pressured by the president? Well, I mean, they, they are the ones who say yes or no. I personally cannot help but believe that uh, the president matters. I mean, you do not want to be in, in a job where the president says the biggest mistake that I made was to appoint so-and-so, you know, to do it. So there is the pressure. I trust that they are wonderful technocrats, and they are. The Federal Reserve people who run it know what they're doing. But I'm not terribly sure that uh, it, it is that they're not possible. Susceptible. It is yeah. possible as human <clears throat> beings not to feel that, that pressure. You're shaking no, your head. I, I, I see I, that. Uh, no, I just, I just don't see it. We have, it happened that the president is, wanted this to occur and it has occurred. I think we have here correlation, not causation. The Fed is independent. And, you know, uh, both of us are in academics, so we're tenured. The, the head of the, the board of governors are tenured. They cannot be fired except for cause. And, they, and that, the law was created that way to protect him from this kind of political influence. I don't think for a second that Jerome Powell and his others care. And then the, the others that voted for it, I'm, I, yeah. I follow uh, Bullard at uh, St. Louis very closely. He's the president of the St. Louis Fed. He's not appointed by the president. He's appointed by the, the member banks within the St. Louis district. He can't be fired by Mr. Uh, by Mr. Trump. So I think that the effect of Mr. Trump's... Uh, Complaining was essentially zero. The what Fed is simply doing the right thing. What about this business of worrying about the value of the dollar and whether that is something that really falls within the purview of the Fed? No. The no. answer, we, we, we know that this is the responsibility of the Treasury because, like Mike said, the Fed has very strict guidelines, what we call the dual mandate, employment, growth, and inflation. To add a third one, the dollar, for example, or stock market would complicate the situation incredibly bad. So is the Fed worried about the dollar? Is there some evidence no. of this? You don't think so? No, I, because they can do nothing about it. So I don't even, I agree with you completely that if either group within the government has a power, it would be the Treasury, not the Fed. But the Treasury shouldn't even bother because the dollar is too important across the world. Its value is whatever the market says it's going to be. And the Treasury cannot intervene easily and change the value of the dollar. And so the dollar's value is what the dollar's value is. The Fed does not know what the right or wrong amount would be. And the, we, they, they simply have to react domestically to what that dollar value is. And, and most of the things that affect the value of the dollar are not beyond the control of, they are beyond the control of the U.S. Uh, government. Uh, Brexit is affecting it, right? And the weakness in uh, Europe, the weakness in China, the weakness in Japan, these are all affecting this, this uh, whole bundle of uh, currencies. We don't have any control over any of that. So trying to fix it, trying to react to it, I think is a mistake. This may be a naive question, but um, how worried or not are you about the fact that we've had all this sustained growth in the stock market for so long that superstitiously, mm -hmm. don't we think it's got to bottom out? We, we do not know. We do not know. I think this is the, the professional answer because you need the trigger 
for somehow expectations to become so pessimistic that people, and we do not really know what the trigger may be. Uh, usually it is some big bad disaster like for instance when the housing prices started declining and that caused the difficulties. Well, Tassos Miliaris and Mike Miller, we are always grateful that you come to talk to us about oh, these things. We'll see you again, I figure, pretty soon. Yes. <laughs> There's you. more on Chicago tonight. Stay with us. This evening's presentation of Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by ComEd, powering lives. We have a tremendous source of untapped efficient energy right here in our school. Let her rip, Jenny. I kind of love this idea. <laughs> The ComEd Energy Efficiency Program has real ideas for making schools energy efficient. Pedal faster! Still to come on Chicago Tonight, our Spotlight Politics team's team on some fishy bookkeeping by a former candidate for mayor. The detailed doll houses she's made fill her basement. Now she dreams of creating a museum to share those doll houses with the world. Jeffrey Bear takes us inside Chicago's Polish cathedral-style churches in tonight's Ask Jeffrey. And a visit to uh, a visit, we visit, that is, a local house on the route of the Underground Railroad, which was built by a man who was also an accomplished painter. But first, another major financial player has admitted that it was hacked. Capital One Financial, one of the country's largest issuers of credit cards, says a hacker has obtained the personal information of more than 100 million of its card users. This comes just one week after credit reporting giant Equifax agreed to pay up to $700 million to settle a lawsuit over a 2017 data breach that left some 147 million people exposed. So is this the new normal and what can consumers do to protect themselves. Joining us to share their expertise are Blaise Orr. He's assistant professor of computer science at the University of Chicago and a specialist on cybersecurity. And Thomas Johnson, vice president of public and board relations at the Better Business, Better Business Bureau, that is, which works to educate its members about cybersecurity threats. And gentlemen, welcome to Chicago tonight. First of all, uh, Thomas Johnson, real quickly, what did you make of the latest major data breach at Capital One? Well, let's start out with your question. Is this the new normal? And the answer is yes. It's literally become the Wild West out there. And this is just another big example of a major uh, cyber attack. And people information is something that they really need to protect at all cost any way that they can. And uh, Blaze, your reaction to what uh, happened to Capital One? Right. Um, so I agree that it feels like it's the new normal. Um, it seems like every every week there's another major data br uh, breach. And as you said, it's coming right on the heels of the Equifax settlement. Um, right. And so I, I think it's becoming the new normal for consumers. And a lot of the burden is being pushed onto us as consumers. Like, oh, we have to go do this. We have to go do this. We have to go do this. Um, and I think it's really hitting on some some major um, systemic issues in the way we handle data breaches as a, as a society and as a country. Well, aside from uh, for, aside from consumers, Thomas Johnson, the uh, the impact is this happen happening on companies. Uh, what is known about uh, how the hacker uh, did what she did? In this case, it was a well. Was I'll leave a woman. that up. I'll leave that up to Blaze. I love the cyber cyber security experts, but I will tell you, businesses are really being harmed by this. And it's the big business. It's the big companies, the big data breaches that make the big news. But small businesses are really being crushed by this in many examples as well. Uh, the statistics show us that uh, about half of the small business businesses out there can only survive three months if they get cyber attacked. Small businesses make up uh, the great deal of the job market in the United States. So when they get hit and knocked out of business or really set back, it really affects employment too. So it's big, small, medium. Uh, they're all being hit in a variety of ways. Blaze, how did this one happen right. from what you know? Yeah, so from what I know, um, this one's actually a little bit different than, than the, the new normal. Um, basically, Capital One, like many companies, stores their data in the cloud. In this case, they're storing it on Amazon's cloud. Um, and even though you're storing data on the cloud with someone else, um, what, you have, what you end up doing is you have to configure it yourself. And it turns out there was a misconfiguration. There are firewalls, from what I understand, were misconfigured. And so the suspected hacker, um, you know, Paige Thompson, 
went and just downloaded the data and made a copy of it for herself. Um, and there, it's become to begun to come out that there might have been other companies that she did this to uh, as well. And she had basically outed herself. She posted what she had gotten on GitHub, which is a popular site for collaboration for computer programmers, um, and talked about it in some chat rooms. Why would she have done this? Right, so you know, that's, a, that's a really big uh, open question. Um, but you know, a lot of the data breaches um, are motivated financially. Someone takes the data um, about you and tries to sell it on the dark web. Right, in, in this case, um, yeah, we don't really know um, what she was thinking. Was she trying to expose vulnerability or was mm -hmm. it an ego thing? Potentially mm -hmm. all of the above, none of the above, but I'm sure we'll find answers in uh, the coming months to Thomas those questions. John excuse me, Thomas Johnson, how much culpability should go to uh, Capital One in this case? Uh, they're, not, uh, they're not a small business like the ones you alluded to. Presumably they have the resources to put up a good, uh, a good uh, wall of protection against hacking. And, and Blaze was right. They thought they had a good wall of protection, and there was a vulnerability. So they do have uh, they do have duties to the consumer to make sure that they are monitored safely uh, in the future. Equifax had to do that. They had to offer up to six uh, credit reports a year for several years right now because of that data breach. That's part of the FTC settlement. So companies need to really uh, come back and try to protect consumers after this has happened. Uh, Blaze, we're often told that uh, as a consumer you should uh, suspect your information, and if you suspect your information has been pa uh, hacked, uh, you should check your credit report. And why is that? Just a very basic question. Right. So, I mean, basically, if you suspect your information has been hacked, if someone has gotten your social security number, um, we as Americans treat our social security number as a secret identifier mm -hmm. that proves to everyone that, oh, you're the person who's trying to open this bank account or, um, you know, obtain this line of credit. Um, and, you know, while we use social security numbers as secret identifiers, um, you know, people, if they get your social, they, they can pretend to be you. And so if you, if you go online to look at your, uh, look at your, your credit report, you can see if somebody's opened accounts and that sort of thing. Right, you can see those sorts of things. And th there are services um, that sell credit monitoring, um, but probably the most uh, basic thing you can do is freeze your credit. Um, within the last, it, it used to be the case that you had to pay to freeze your credit and then to unfreeze it or thaw your credit each time uh, an inquiry needed to be made legitimately. Because but if you freeze mm -hmm. your credit, that means right. uh, somebody cannot apply right. for an account or something because that uh, institution would then go to check your credit, and if it's frozen, right. that, ends, uh, that ends the exercise. Exactly, and for legitimate requests, you have a secret PIN uh, number that you can use to, to release, your, to thaw your credit for the moment. Uh, um, so you should do that. Blaine, last time we had you on, you, you, uh, you gave us some tips to, uh, that consumers can use to uh, protect against data breaches. Number right. one, use different passwords everywhere. Number mm -hmm. two, to better manage your different passwords, use password manager software. Number three, enable two-factor authentication. Uh, number four, be careful of phishing emails. Number five, think about what kind of information you are sharing with uh, companies. We're we're putting all these on our website, but uh, Thomas Johnson, give me an idea of what uh, what kinds of advice the Better Business Bureau is giving companies as uh, as companies try to fight it at their end. They really need to look at cybersecurity, and and I agree with Blaze. We tell people now it's not only a good idea to check your annual credit report; you have to do it now in this day and age. And for businesses, they really need to make sure they have a cybersecurity plan. We've been doing free panels for a couple of years on cybersecurity, and we include cyber insurance, which has become a big deal. Cyber legal, if you're a company, you need to consider that, and you need to talk to a cybersecurity expert. It's it's just hands down that you need to uh, find a cybersecurity expert to just go over your plan. Make sure your firewall is, is, is strong. It's something a lot of small businesses and medium-sized businesses put at the end, but it's really something that has to come to the forefront now. In the case of Capital One and other large companies that, that have been hacked, uh, there are also instances where a large company uses vendors, and to what extent is a, a vendor a potential point of vulnerability? It's a huge point of vulnerability, and people should always check their vendors. It's become a big deal where a lot of uh, big uh, agencies and government agencies and companies have to make sure that their vendors have good cybersecurity because if they get into your system, it's it's a direct hack into your company in a lot of cases. Um, to, uh, Blaze, do you think uh, do you think companies get it at this point in terms of what they need to do to protect consumers to do their part? Right, so I think they, they partially get it. Um, and the reason I say that is that they understand that there is a risk, right? But the consequences can be bad for business, but not that bad for business, right? Because, you know, Equifax is still around, 
Target's still around, Home Depot's still around. They're doing quite well, in fact. Um, and so the penalties they face um, really you know, aren't really hurting them. And so they're, they're investing enough to, you know, they're, they're, I would say, doing the bare minimum um, and pushing a lot of the burden onto consumers. Uh, Thomas Johnson, last word on that, uh, too much burden on consumers? I think so. I think consumers have to be really proactive, and it's unfortunate, but that's just become the way that it is. And uh, they not only have to check their annual credit report, check, check your bank statement every single month, and uh, as Blaze mentioned, thaw and freeze your credit reports when you're not using it, and then nobody can get in. Blaze or Thomas Johnson, thank you both for uh, joining us. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. And you can find more tips on how to protect your data on our website. And up next, breaking down the political headlines in this week's Spotlight Politics. Don't ever miss Chicago Tonight. Subscribe to our podcast. Get a daily download of our show delivered to your desktop or mobile device. Go to WTTW.com slash Chicago Tonight Podcast and subscribe. A big-time labor leader is cooperating with the feds. What might the former Teamster chief spill? And workers who tried to get Amara Enya elected as Chicago mayor are now suing her. Our Spotlight's politics team is here to tackle that. Plus, positive budget news for Illinois. We're joined by Amanda Vinicky, Parrish Schutz, and Carol Marine. Always good to sit with you. Uh, Carol, let's start with John Coley. He was uh, John Coley Sr., that is. Uh, who is he and what's he, uh, what's he done? He's the boss of the Teamsters, and as such, he had great relationships to governors like Blagojevich and the Quinn administration, to mayors like Rahm Emanuel, uh, controlled a huge union, and what he, by his own admission, has done has uh, taken $325,000 in extortion payments. He extorted them from Cinespace, that big compound that produces Chicago Fire and Chicago Med and those kinds of things. Uh, and he was secretly recorded by Alex Pizios, who runs Cinespace, and now Coley, it looks, is going to be a cooperator like Alex Pizios. And uh, so what are, what are the potential ramifications of his working with the feds? M what might he tell them? Well, in, in, the, uh, in the release, I mean, the feds basically said he's going to cooperate on other cases with them. So it almost reminds me of John Christopher in Operation Silver Shovel. He knows everybody. And he might, I, I don't know if this is how it happened. When he said, I know everybody, so I've got all kinds of stuff to tell you, so go lighter on my sentence. I don't know if that's how it happened. But, I mean, y you know the feds are investigating Ed Burke, Kerry Austin. Uh, Mike Madigan has been caught up in some of these investigations. So Coley ostensibly had connections to any and all of them, or they could be com and other investigations we don't know about. We also know that a, another Teamsters official, and that is State Senator Tom Cullerton, who is not a distant confused. relative, exactly. With John Cullerton, they're not connected. Right, the State Senate President. They're, they're both State Senators. But anyway, this is Tom Cullerton, that his personnel records have been subpoenaed, his travel records from 2013 to 2016, so about this time that the feds were we're looking into extortion by the part of Coley. So it may well be that this goes not just on the state level but, or on the city level, but also stateside. We also know, for example, that some of the high ranking officials in former Governor Pat Quinn's administration had connections, got money. There's some strange stuff with Pizios helping to pay for engagement. an sorry, engagement, engagement ring. ring to for the press sec Quinn's press secretary from Quinn's former campaign manager who went on to get a job with the state sports facility authority. So, I mean, there's all sorts of people that knew Coley and that benefited from it. sounds like it's, uh, it's impossible to say where the feds might be connecting some dots and where these dots might be. What's interesting to me, as always, and to all of us, I think, is that the prosecutor, Amer Bachu, who is looking into Ed Burke and all of that constellation of Chicago politicians, is also the person who is overseeing everything involving Cinespace. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're not totally separate kinds of probes, 
But in Chicago, I think it's that matrix that we're always exploring. And so there's somebody who has, uh, who's getting the big picture of any connections that might exist between these seemingly uh, separate worlds. Certainly Mr. Bachu, the prosecutor, has his hands full right now with investigations. Let's talk, let's move on to uh, another topic, and that has to do with uh, Amara Enya. Uh, two dozen campaign workers, former campaign workers, are suing her. What's going on? Well, they're saying they haven't gotten paid, and they're wondering why. And I've talked to so many campaign workers in this campaign that say they've gotten a the runaround. Um, that uh, the first excuse was, well, no, you're a volunteer. And they said, no, we were workers. We're supposed to get paid. Now what Enya is saying is, well, I ended my campaign with a debt. I've been trying to raise money. You know I have a debt, and I'm trying in good faith. The problem here is if you look at her D2 reports that are filed with the uh, Board of Elections, there's all kinds of funny-looking payments here. We did a report in April showing payments to consulting groups that we couldn't find any record of. We found tons of payments to one address, 728 South Oakley, which happens to be a place that she used to live and now her sister lives there. She said she was going to fix all of this with the elections board. She filed an amended uh, return, uh, report about two weeks ago and hasn't fixed any of it. And one of the things for Amara Enya, she began this campaign with debts from previous campaigns that ended up being erased by uh, beneficiaries. Of mm. Kanye West gave her some money, Chance the Rapper gave her some money. And one of her arguments is, look, I'm just a common person struggling to make ends meet like all of you, which was, for some people, a kind of persuasive argument. But, but you can't have that argument but, for years and years and, and these years. are very bizarre and very strange mistakes and very, very simple mistakes that she's making and not fixing. I mean, these are things that election authorities haven't really even seen before. Uh, so there's, there's a lot of questions here. She was seen as having a bright future. Uh, how would you assess uh, the state of her prospects now, Amanda? Well, as Carol noted, her argument that sh her personal debts were something that made her be able to relate to just your everyday Chicagoan really did resonate with people. We do also know that she's up for a job. She's one of several candidates who was going to potentially be the director for the city council's progressive caucus. So she certainly is persuasive. She performed well during debates. This may not be the death knell, but you would think that if anybody was going to hire her for her organizational bookkeeping skills further, she'd served as a municipality, as basically, the, the, you know, like their top executive, their top hired hand. There were problems there as well. So one would think that it would give anybody pause. Uh, Amanda, let's stay with you. Uh, there's a rare bright spot in Illinois finances. What is that bright spot? Nobody should be breaking out their party <laughs> hats. I mean, this isn't celebratory news or anything, but we do have a ratings agency Fitch that has moved Illinois outlook from negative to stable. So it's a little bit like, you know, we still have a, a weather forecast that looks a bit ominous. It's not as if it's good. Illinois still has the worst credit rating in the nation, but Maybe, just maybe, that, that storm won't the come right away. The tornado won't touch down. Maybe there it'll we just go. stay up maybe. in the air. Mm -hmm. well, let's tag up on something that we touched on earlier in the newscast, and that has to do with Kelly Cassidy, who is one of the lead sponsors of the um, move to legalize marijuana in the state. As we mentioned, her husband, her wife, uh, Candace Gingrich, is joining a Florida-based cannabis uh, company. What uh, reaction around the table to that? You know, this is one of those things, and, and I know she said, I checked with the ethics officer, and they're fine with it. In Illinois, the ethics structure is so hobbled anyway that I don't think that that's a reassuring statement. It is, at the very least, an appearance of a conflict of interest, whether it's genuinely one or not. I think it gives everyone pause because we've seen this movie again and again and again. And she was, if not the lead, one of the leads in getting this cannabis bill passed. And there's well, just... She was one of the faces one of, of the, faces uh, of 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 the movement. One of the faces of There's so many things in here that we don't know what was put in there um, at the behest of one marijuana company or another, and so it has to be looked into what the connection is here. Now, the company is saying that she's not going to be involved, uh, at least for the time being, in any uh, business activities in Illinois. Is that a... How big of a safety precaution is that? You know, this is all still emerging. We found out about this, in fact, because the company put out a press release on Gingrich's hiring. Cassidy, I spoke with her. She said she is not only checked with the ethics officer, but said she's proud of Candace Gingrich for getting this job. And further, for Revolution, hiring somebody that will serve as an advocate for the LBGTQ 
community, given how many, uh, she believes that this is the first company to have somebody in that sort of role, and given all the efforts that particularly in Illinois were made to try and give licenses, to have people profit off of this that aren't just your typical players, that there are going to be dispensary licenses and such given to people in impoverished communities. So that was something that she highlighted. Amanda Paris, Carol, thank you all very much. It goes by so fast. I know, time flies when you're having fun <laughs> with your colleagues. <laughs> We never really know what event in a child's life will have the greatest impact for the woman you are about to meet. It was a handmade gift from her father. Here is Jay Shevsky. When I was five years old, my father made a dollhouse for me. Made everything, all the furniture, wooden furniture. Played with it every single day. Pat Lohenry has loved miniatures for as long as she can remember. As a teenager, she went from playing with them to making them. And today, they're all in her basement. 20 dollhouses and 170 room boxes. Wow. It's a magical place overflowing with her creations. This is January. I can't seem to stop. I want to do more and more and more. Fanatical? No. I just love the miniatures. And, you know, you can tell a story with miniatures. Look closely and you can see those stories. The boy crying because the ice cream fell off his cone. The queen angry at her drunken maid. Or the girls pouting on the 4th of July because the boys have cotton candy. <laughs> I love these yeah. two girls. They're not happy. <laughs> Pat says there's a divide among people who make miniatures about whether or not to include people. Chicago's most famous miniatures do not. The beloved Thorn Rooms at the Art Institute of Chicago were designed and commissioned by wealthy socialite Narcissa Thorn. Pat loves and admires the Thorn Rooms, she says, but she wants more life in her boxes, so she puts in people. What about the clothes? I make all of them. You make all of these clothes? Yeah, I make all the dolls. I've made thousands of dolls. Wait, you make the dolls themselves? And the hair. You can lose your religion putting hair on a doll. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's true. Pat buys the porcelain doll parts, but then does the rest herself. Now, Pat does not make every item in every room. She doesn't make the animals or little food items or utensils, but she does make most of what you see in most scenes. The rug there is needlepoint, okay? What? Wait, that's your own needlepoint? Yes. Wow. <laughs> now, how did Pat Lo Henry go from playing with dollhouses to building them? Simple. When she was 13, that dollhouse her dad built was getting too full. So I decided I'm going to put an addition on this dollhouse. Did I know how to build anything? No. But she learned. And all the carpentry you see is hers. Men would go like, oh my god. Your husband, you, he built it. I go, no, he doesn't even know what a hammer is. Pat Lohenry does not sell her miniatures. In the 80s, she had a small storefront museum for a few years, and now she's in her 80s, and that's what she wants again. This is a sin to have it down here and not share it. But Pat is retired and on a fixed income, so she says the rent for a space that would hold all this is out of the question. So for now, she will just keep on making them. And my family will say, stop making so much stuff. You got enough stuff, stop making it. You know, I can't stop. And that original dollhouse furniture that her dad made for her nearly 80 years ago, now it's in one of her boxes. Some people get dollhouses, you know, and they play with it for a while and then, you know, they get tired of it. I never got tired. Never got tired of dollhouses. For Chicago Tonight, this is Jay Shefsky. Hmm. 
Pat Lo Henry teaches miniature making in her basement workshop. She hopes that someday she can move her classes and all her creations to the museum of her dreams. You can find out more on our website. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. When driving along the Kennedy Expressway, you may have noticed massive churches that seem to almost line up with the curves and bends of the highway. While they may only get a quick look from commuters, or perhaps a longer one if there's traffic, these churches have acted as centers of community and worship for generations of Chicagoans. And their legacy goes back even further. Here to explain is Jeffrey Bear in tonight's edition of Ask Jeffrey. And Jeffrey, let's get to this All right. first question. And the question is, what is the Polish cathedral architectural style, and why are there so many examples in Chicago? Right, so those are the churches you alluded to in your lead-in these big giant churches. You, you probably will not find the term Polish cathedral in any architecture books. It's uh, more of an anecdotal term. Um, generally, the Polish cathedral style, um, and take a look at these, um, it's used to describe churches like this one, St. Mary of the Angels, originally built to serve immigrant Polish communities. The churches are very large and opulent in design. You might even call them lavish. Look at this. Some of the first uh, in Chicago, like, like this one, St. Stanislaus Koska, are around Wicker Park and Bucktown, uh, those neighborhoods where Poles first settled in large numbers in the late 1800s. So as you mentioned, Phil, in your lead-in, this church and several others are visible from the Kennedy Expressway. In fact, if you're driving downtown in the right lane, you come within feet of it. Um, you uh, can prop there practically take communion from your car. <laughs> there you go. Uh, the, the Kennedy was actually rerouted around this church, uh, St. Stanislaus Koska, um, so they didn't have to be torn down. Um, it was built in 1881 for a parish founded in 1867. It's often referred to as the mother of Polish churches in the city. It's the oldest congregation. And at its peak in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, get this, it had over 35,000 thousand parishioners and oh it held gosh. 12 masses every Sunday to accommodate them all according to a, an architectural historian whom we talked to mm. uh, and you can see the twin steeples there um, that's a trademark of this Polish cathedral style and notice that the one on the right of course is missing its cupola that's because it was struck by lightning in 1964 um, another classic Polish cathedral um, which is also visible from from the Kennedy is St. Mary of the Angels in Bucktown which I mentioned earlier um, it opened in 1920 and again there's that hallmark of two steeples um, they stand over the church's 26 rooftop angel statues which gaze down at passerby passersby from various edges along the roof's perimeter um, hard to believe this is even in Chicago and then let's go inside and you'll see the heavy ornamentation and the imagery on the walls there's expansive murals and paintings depicting saints and angels and they're bordered with gold trim and ornate patterns and mosaics. Look at that um, uh, image there. So they are completely unlike this kind of church. Um, unlike the Gothic style churches from the 12th and 13th centuries in Europe, those kind of churches had elaborate stonework, uh, soaring arches, pointy steeples, flying buttresses. Polish cathedrals owe more to this kind of architecture, the highly ornate Renaissance and Baroque traditions of the 16th and 17th centuries. Is that Versailles? Yeah, and that, that, so it, it owes a lot to the, like, the Palace of Versailles. Uh, these Chicago churches are called Polish cathedrals, but as the, there's really only one official cathedral, cathedral yes, in Chicago. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, while there are many uh, churches in Chicago that are familiarly called Polish cathedrals, there is only one Catholic church that is an actually formally recognized as a true cathedral, and it's this one, Holy Name, on the near north side, and it's called a cathedral because it's the seat of the archdiocese in Chicago. And as, as you can see, it's definitely more in that Gothic style. So why did builders of Chicago's Polish cathedrals choose the Renaissance 
and Baroque style instead of the Gothic style okay, that we right. see in Holy Name. Exactly. Um, even though it's called a cathedral, it looks more like Versailles. Um, the, these these um, churches harken back to the style that was popular during what was called the Polish Golden Age, which was during the 16th and 17th centuries. And this was just a brief period of peace and security compared to much of Polish history when the country was constantly under threat from its neighbors. Um, Poles in the Golden Age hired architects from Italy who constructed extravagant buildings in that, that Renaissance and Baroque style um, in their native country. Interesting. I once heard uh, a person say that Poland, uh, like itself to Christ because it was between two thieves, Germany on the one side and Russia on the other. But why are Chicago's Polish cathedrals so big? A bit more on that because some of those churches look larger Enormous. than Holy Name Cathedral. Huge, huge. And, and this is because Chicago's Polish immigrant population was huge. Um, although the, you know, we've all heard this claim that Chicago was the largest Polish city outside of Warsaw. There's been some debate about that, um, but it was nonetheless absolutely true that Chicago was the center of Polish life in the United States for many years. Polish newspapers and organizations flourished here, and of course, so did the churches, and all those new immigrants needed these, these huge places to worship. There were, there were thousands of them, and uh, these opulent churches like St. Mary's also were built big for another purpose. Uh, they were kind of like stakes in the ground. Mm for the Polish community, ways to say, we're proud of our heritage, it survives thousands of miles from our native land. Statement buildings in a way. Yes, absolutely. Jeffrey, thank you for your statements, as always. My pleasure. And you can visit our website for more information on the Polish cathedral architectural style. And while you're there, don't forget to submit your question to Jeffrey Baer. And we are back right after this. <laughs> He was an Illinois sheep farmer who ran a safe house on the Underground Railroad. This pioneer of the prairie also grew into a singular artist. His frontier portraits are masterpieces of folk art. Now an art show at a historic home explores the life of a man with a passion for painting and human rights. Paris Schutz brings us another look. 22 miles west of Chicago in DuPage County stands a humble home built 180 years ago. It was built in 1839. It's the oldest house in Lombard. It was the first school in Lombard. Now it is temporarily a gallery showcasing the artwork made by the farmer who built the house, Sheldon Peck, an early American activist. He and his wife Harriet sheltered freedom seekers on their 200 acre farm back when Lombard was known as Babcock's Grove. Sheldon Peck was a conductor on the Underground Railroad. He lived here with his family. His sons participated and his wife Harriet participated in the Underground Railroad. Uh, we were part of the National Park Service Network to Freedom. And uh, Sheldon Peck lived here but worked elsewhere as he was painting portraits across the state into Wisconsin. And uh, he was all through this area working with his art and painting but also with his abolitionist movement. Originally from Vermont, Peck settled west of Chicago and painted while traveling the Fox River Valley. This portrait shows a family from Aurora, Illinois. The patriarch holds the abolitionist newspaper, The Western Citizen. This early work shows a man with tanning vats, indicating his occupation. This painting depicts a Kane County judge who was later shot down in his office by a romantic rival. Details include Bibles, law books, even a family dog. In the era before photography, Sheldon Peck captured the likenesses of friends and family, but he risked his livelihood for strangers. Conductors, or the people helping, could have been jailed. They were fined in very high amounts. It would have ruined their family if they were caught. Peck was never caught. He continued helping people, and he kept on painting them. The faces are what matters the furrowed brow, the very stern look, the piercing eyes. Of the entire exhibition, what my favorite thing is, is when somebody walks in and they just stand in this room and see the, the work that Sheldon Peck did and was able to share and how through the eyes of the sitter, you can actually see who these people are. He painted for households, not museums, yet two of his portraits are now prominently on display in the Art Institute's Gallery of American Folk Art. 
In 1997, a painting of his featured on Antiques Roadshow sold at auction for $80,000. Others have gone for much more. The legacy he started from this home reached beyond the art world. The Sheldon Peck legacy is what we call a modest house with a radical history. Sheldon Peck was a modest farmer. He was an everyday man. But the history of this house and the story that can be told here is one that's not an everyday story. It's a radical history. And it has to do with the level of the anti-slavery advocate that he was and what he did to help other people. Sheldon Peck lived in a very challenging time prior to the Civil War, and he was fighting for something much grander than himself. And he had the courage to do that. And the courage it took to say, I believe in racial equality. For Chicago Tonight, this is Paris Schutz. Sheldon Peck lived until 1868, three years after the Civil War ended. His home stayed in the family until the 1990s when it was donated by his descendants to the Lombard Historical Society. The exhibitions of his paintings will be at the Sheldon Peck homestead through August, and there is more to see on our website. And that is our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. We review the Democratic presidential hopefuls, hopefuls and their performances this week on the debate stage and a new biography of legendary baseball broadcaster Harry Carey. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Phil Ponce and I thank you for watching. Good night. Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.